The second type of system we have is a chaotic system, and there's all sorts of different ways in which people use chaos. A lot of people, to my mind, confuse chaos theory and complexity theory. Um, but I have to define my terms. I'm talking about chaos in terms of randomness. So a chaotic system is one in which the agents are completely unconstrained. Now, the irony is in a chaotic system, the agents are deterministic, but the system is non-deterministic. Right? But fundamentally, you've got totally random behavior. And again, we don't find that difficult because that's where probability and statistics come into their own. So we can start to manage that if we've got sufficiently large volumes of data. So we've been comfortable with those for some time. But it's only after the last 100 years or so we become aware of complex adaptive systems. Uh, I think in real, real, really, we should trace this back to Prigogine in chemistry. Um, Peter Allen, who's a colleague of mine, was one of his PhD students. This is still comparatively recent. Kafkin in biology, art in economics, and a whole group, group of us in social systems. Complex adaptive systems are one where the nature of the system means that it lightly constrains the agents, but not fully constrains them, and the agents modify the system as they interact with it. The technical phrase for this, this is your second new word, possibly, is the system and the agents co-evolve. Uh, co-evolution is a key concept in biology. As things interact with other things, patterns form from the interaction. And a key concept which goes with that is you have irreversibility. You can't reverse evolution, whereas you can re-engineer a machine. <coughs> And that is actually why, and I'll talk about this later, weak signal detection is so critical in social systems. The earlier you detect something, the lower the energy cost of amplification or damping. By the time it becomes visible on conventional scanning systems, the energy cost of disruption is far too high. A lot of my work in the was funded both before and after 9-11 by the US and Singapore governments on counterterrorism, and their weak signal detection is absolutely key. And of course, everybody with the benefit of hindsight can tell you that people learning to fly but not take off and land is significant. But hindsight doesn't lead to foresight. Everybody forgets the sheer amount of data being reported in advance. And actually, with the benefit of hindsight, you can connect up the dots because now you can see the linkages. But you can't connect up the dots in advance. And one of the issues there is how do you make people or bring things to the attention of humans and again, I'll talk later about generating human sensor networks, because if you can literally get thousands of people involved in partial decision making, you hugely increase the scanning range and you reduce the danger of pattern entrainment. The Cardinal Bellamini type moments I referred to earlier. So a complex adaptive system is a co-evolution of agents and system. It's inherently unpredictable. Now, there are two schools of thought on this, and we're going to have to fight in the U.S. government sponsorship in Brisbane next week. Don't ask me why the U.S. government are organizing the conference in Brisbane, but they are at this time of the year, but never mind. Right? Um, and the, the group, those of us who are right say that the systems are non-causal. Those who are wrong say that they are causal, but it's not meaningful. We can never discover what it is. Right? So actually, it doesn't make too much difference in practice, yeah, which one you want to go with. But it will be a fun two-day debate with a group of 50 philosophers that may or may not come back alive. Right? <laughs> uh, but fundamentally, hold that in your mind. If a system cannot be predicted, how do you manage it? Because everything that we've always done has been based for the last two or three years on the assumption that if you can't predict the future, it's a failure of analysis or data capture. It's the core behind setting targets a year out. The assumption is you should be able to say in advance what you should be able to achieve. The reality is if you're dealing with a complex adaptive system, you can't. And one of the fundamental switches on this, again, I sort of highlighted things I'm going to come to when I come to solutions, is a shift from outcome-based measurement to impact-based measurement. So instead of measuring process-based outcomes, you start to measure impact which allows you to measure things which are successful, which weren't predicted before they were known. And we're doing that work in the development community in Africa, the Gates Foundation, and elsewhere at the moment. So there's a big changes coming on. Now, there's an easier way of understanding this. Um, sorry, the philosophy in me will come out from time to time. Uh, those three systems are effectively different types of ontology. And I'm using ontology here in the philosophical sense of the word, not the IT corruption of it, which means the taxonomy. Right? An ontology is the nature of the world, the nature of the system. An ontology precedes epistemology. 
The nature of the work, the nature of the system, determines the nature of the way we know things and react things. So the fundamental argument here is if it's an ordered system, you know it and you act in it in a very different way than if it's a complex system. And this is a principle effectively called about diverse response. It's one of my big disagreements with John Seddon that you've had here before, who basically goes from one extreme to the other and denies the validity of ordered systems approaches. Yeah, a true complex adaptive systems view, in fact, I would argue a true systems view of the world, says there is a space for highly structured targeted approaches, and there's other spaces where it doesn't work. Yeah, effectively methodological diversity, but we need to understand the boundaries. So one way to explain this is think, if you can, about how you would manage a children's party. Everybody can manage organizing a party for a bunch of eight or nine-year-olds. Right, so basically, depending on what type of system is in, we manage it in a different way. So if it's a chaotic system, then the children's behavior will be completely at random. They'll probably discover the drugs and alcohol and go on a personal experience of self-discovery. Uh, your house will probably burn down in the process, but all property is theft and it was socially constructed in the first place, so why are you worried? And yes, there is a stiletto in that one. Um, I have friends in California who've tried this, but only once. You know, the recovery cost is high. Um, but it's a valid approach. The order systems approach, on the other hand, you'd be more familiar with, particularly those of you with administrative responsibilities within the university. Under this, it's of critical importance to agree learning objectives for the party in advance of the party itself. The learning objectives should be aligned with the mission statement for education in society to which you belong, and should be clearly articulated and printed off on motivational posters with pictures of eagles soaring over valleys and water dropping into ponds, and placed around the room where you're going to hold the party. You then produce a project plan for the party. The project plan should have clear milestones throughout the party against which you can measure progress against the ideal party outcome. And the senior adult should start the party with a motivational videotape because you don't want the children wasting time in play which isn't aligned with the learning objectives. Then they use PowerPoint to show their personal commitment to the party and to demonstrate to the children how their pocket money is linked to the achievement of the milestone targets. Following the highly successful completion of the party, you conduct an after-action review, update your best practice database on party management, and mandate future process improvements. If at the end of this, for any reason, the ungrateful brats aren't happy, you hire an appreciative inquiry practitioner who will get them to tell happy clappy stories so they have happy mental models and suitably indoctrinated, they'll like whatever you put in front of them next time. Everybody reasonably familiar with this approach to party management? <laughs> the complex systems approach, on the other hand, is very different. We start off by drawing a line in the sand called the boundary, and say, cross that, you little bastards, and you die. <laughs> and one of the things you learn fast as an adult is the value of flexible, negotiable boundaries, because rigid boundaries become brittle and break catastrophically. We then throw in catalytic probes. I'm now deliberately using the language of complexity. A football, a videotape, a barbecue, a computer game to see if a pattern of play known as an attractor will form as a result of the catalyst. Yeah? If it's a beneficial attractor, we give it more resource. If it's a non-beneficial attractor, we pull resource away from it. So what we actually do, and this is kind of like probably the key phrase of the whole lecture, we manage the emergence of beneficial coherence within attractors, within boundaries. And in that phrase, you have the great hope of complexity theory for government and industry alike. Because you manage what can be managed. You don't try and force a complex system to pretend it's ordered simply because that's the strategy system you adopted. Because the trouble is if you do that, the tension will build up into the system until eventually it breaks into chaos. We did some work while I was in IBM. We actually looked at the density of informal networks against the perceived level of bureaucracy by firm. And there is a direct correlation between the two. The more bureaucratic the organization, the denser the informal network. Because human beings are basically quite nice. And if the system does bad things, they try and work together to stop the system doing bad things. Yeah? As a result of which, system failure is disguised for longer than it should be. So when actually, it's like an earthquake, when the tension really builds, the break is catastrophic. So the fundamental argument of this is you need to, as horses for courses, use that phrase, 
you use different management techniques in order, in chaos, in complexity. And the problem is all of our management techniques, and particularly our project management techniques, have grown up on the assumption of order or the privileging of order, when the reality is, in a socio-technical environment, we're dealing with complexity. And that requires us, to quote Lincoln, to think anew, to act anew in a different way. But it's clear to get the boundaries first. 